And uh, we're in the uh, quiet period, let's say, of uh, Ulster Club and the uh, All Ireland Club Championships. You know, the the championship is over. But we look ahead to the new year, the McKenna Cup on the horizon, then the National League, and then the championship. But can I ask you, first of all, for your reflection on what I would call the championship 2015? Good, bad, or indifferent? For me, it it was a poor year, you'd, you'd have to say. Now, I don't know whether that opinion has been coloured by the, the media coverage, which just, for me this year, really got out of hand and it was so negative. And just recently we've watched the compromise rules and the, the alternative approach to looking at that game, which has plenty of issues, uh, and yet this, this overflow of, of, of positivity and positive talk and trying to very much uh, look at the positives. Uh, to the approach taken to our own game which was just hugely negative and, and really if there was a great game for 70 minutes and there was an incident in the last two minutes the only thing was talked about was the incident in the last two minutes and the game was in crisis it felt like the whole summer and then we got decent all Ireland semi-finals and the all Ireland final partly due to conditions uh, was just a really poor game and that and that dampened down the game. Sometimes the, the season can be mediocre, you come to the end of the season and if the semi-finals or final is a great game, everybody goes away happy. Unfortunately this year it wasn't quite like that. So certainly it wasn't a vintage year, uh, it was a poor enough year. Good All-Ireland champions, I think Dublin are well well worthy All-Ireland champions, but it wasn't, it wasn't a vintage year. You talk about not a vintage year and of course the GA are in opposition no matter what they think up against the likes of rugby which had the rugby world cup and got a lot of all the headlines and next summer of course is the european soccer championship with both northern ireland and the republic qualified so really the ga needs to up their game but I, i'm not sure how they up their game you know i th- i would almost like to think they, sh- they should just start enforcing the rules as we know them which might be a help I think st- starting to enforce the rules as we know them and starting to make panic reactions to uh, certain issues of the day. We've seen that a couple of times during the summer when there was issues and they were made a big deal of. I think trying to uh, present a more positive image and maybe bringing the players in and 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 involving the players and management more in that uh, just to make sure their conduct on the pitch. I don't think they have to, uh, in one way, drop the competitive side of things, but their, their conduct does have to be uh, that of role models. Uh, the press has another uh, responsibility here. There's an awful lot of people uh, making money and making a living and selling newspapers on the back of GEA. So they, they they have to help the thing as well and not just continually run down the thing because if you continue to run down the thing, as you say, there are other there are other attractions out there for young children to get involved with, uh, very attractive options and, and because of the professional sports and professional athletes they automatically get a lot more coverage because that's they, they're they much more commercially aware and they have to be more commercially aware. Uh, the GA is always struggling in that regard, the last thing we need is to be overtly negative but going back to your initial point, the rule changes and that, this ongoing issue of rule changes. Uh, layers and layers of rules, reactionary rules coming in uh, to some particular issue, it just makes it even more difficult for the referees, it makes uh, for an even greater lack of, of, of consistency and that also damages the game and it means that everybody's talking about other things than the actual athletes and the games themselves. It's rather up, you're here as a triple All-Ireland winner with Tyrone. Tyrone won this year's All-Ireland Under-21 Championship and recently Porrick Duffy who is a uh, perhaps one of our, our best leaders, I was thinking, in recent times, has suggested that the Under-21 Championship be scrapped. And th- that suggestion comes along with the lines with people telling you that the international rules has a future. Now, I don't know what you feel. I know how I feel, but I want to see what you think about that. I suppose from an uh, absolute degree, the park is a, is a gentleman. I know, I know Park well at this stage. And anything the park is doing, it is for the motivation of betterment of the association. He floated the idea of the scrapping the under-21 several years ago, and it's, it's maybe not a particular surprise that it has come up again. Uh, and, and I think whilst, for me, the motives are sound and just behind that, I think there is a worry for most people. In, in the gap that it leaves, particularly if the minors, which is another part of the proposals, if the minors moves from under 18 to under 17, the gap between under 17 and senior county is just massive and where it might be all right for people from very strong clubs that are going back to a very high level of training and a very professional level of football, that their development will continue. For people that are maybe from smaller clubs and maybe one or two standout footballers from a small club, 
where are they going to go at 17 to try to make senior inter-county grade? So that would worry me about one part of the proposals. In terms of the doing away the under-21s, I'm a proud holder of two under-21 all Ireland's and great competition. And for that throwing team that went on to achieve so much, that we won our all Ireland minor. Them under-21 years was the foundation and brought us right up through. There was one or two players, exceptional players, the likes of Cormac McAnallan, the likes of Brian McGuigan, Stephen O'Neill, made the jump straight from minors to seniors. Uh, but that was when Throne Seniors was going through a transition period. For the current Throne players that are trying to break through, the under-21s was critical, and we've seen that again this year, where it was sort of stagnant, and Mickey was bringing people in slowly. With an under-21 success, four or five of them players got parachuted into the senior squad without any National League or Mechanic Cup experience. So that shows how much an under-21 win can develop a player. With the progression or the with an increased intensity of the senior inter county game, I think the age profile has changed at senior county level. The thirty year old inter county player is, is now a relatively rare thing. I think the bulk of the players is going to be between early to late twenties, so between twenty two and twenty seven. That means for the twenty twenty one age group there's going to be more and more of them coming in. So some mm -hmm. suggestions are being put forward that the under twenty ones could be like if you were on a county senior squad, you were missing the under 21s and it was a development level. Or it could be shifted to under 20 if the minors are going to under 17 because most under 20s won't be making a county senior squad. And to avoid that overlap, I think it's crucial that there's a development place between minors and uh, seniors. And I think Park Duffy is, is on that same page too. He's put one proposal forward. I think he'll maybe put a secondary proposal forward to make sure that it isn't I think there is something needs done at that level because there's too much demands on players and that's where Park's coming from. This All these proposals are built on player welfare, player burnout and trying to get a club championship or a time of year for the club. Uh, but in doing that, I think you're you're killing a very important uh, development step. The whole question of discipline too within the game seems to be a bit strange. You know, we had reports in a, in a recent Ulster club match of a player suggested that he was bitten and said he spoke to the referee about it. There's nothing in the referee's report. Where do you go from there? Like, how, how do you cope with it? You know, it? It seems almost implausible that a player would make up a thing like that. Yes, and uh, I, know, I know the player personally, uh, and I know he didn't make it up, <laughs> because I've seen the photographs, uh, and I know he spoke to the referee. So for me, uh, I, I think the referee has to have issues. Did the player speak to him? And if the player spoke to him and mentioned it and he didn't put it in his report, why was that? Uh, and Joe McQuillan has a lot of experience and a lot of uh, a lot of big, big games under the belt. Uh, I, I would be interested why that disappeared. Because in the era of discipline and them things, incidents have to be investigated. Uh, and that can be stamped out. Oh, and that is always just going to be a wink and a nudge and a phone call here and a phone call there and here. Will you drop that, let that go? and it'll all go silently, but that won't correct the things in the pitch. Uh, and I think the likes of a bite and that there, no matter what club done it in Cross McLean, are a very upstanding club, and I'm sure they dispute it, and I know Ashley McConville came out and said that it, it didn't happen. So there is a disparity there in the truth. Maybe it has been sorted out behind closed doors, uh, but certainly it's strange that it didn't at least turn up in the referee's report. There's the word, or the, the saying that uh, almost uh, worries me, behind closed doors. You look at rugby, the Rugby World Cup, there's players missed, were, were banned for the rest of the Rugby World Cup because of incidents on the sub front in a stage state, and yet our discipline, it's, it's an area that for the past 20 years I've been harping on about, I think our discipline just is never, is never seen to be correct. I don't know why, and all counties, we're all to blame. All counties, Toronto have complained, they've, they've worked the system, RMA's worked the system, Dublin's worked, everybody's worked the system. And the system then means, in my opinion, the system's flawed. Absolutely, and it's very hard. Is, is it a part of the Irish psyche to, to sort of challenge people? Like I know, and I, I was no greater at fault than anybody else when, when I was playing football, you, you did feel the need, especially as a more senior player, to try to put a bit of pressure on the referee. And sometimes you were sort of taught or some people would come in and say, look, no point ever speaking to the referee, he'll not change his mind. But because the culture is there, mm -hmm. if you never said a word to referee, he would presume that the decision was right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you were objecting to some of his decisions, you need to at least express his displeasure. But, and I suppose it's coming then from that, but it's hugely difficult for referees at the minute. 
uh, to the, the amount of abuse that they take on the pitch from players that are just hot-headed and it is inside the white line so everybody is acting at the very most aggressive of the personality and that's difficult because the referee, if a player is frustrated with their own game, mm -hmm. they will still lash out at the referee as much in annoyance of themselves. Then away from that, the actual, the actual disciplinary procedures and the bans being handed out and the... I don't know how many layers we have in an appeals process. I think we've more than 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 the European courts. You know, it's just that it, it has got too far, uh, and there's there's solicitors and there's everybody that is well clued into it. So I think that needs to be looked at and changed. And again, Park Duffy has come out and thinks there isn't a problem. I personally think there is. I think there's too many avenues of appeal. I think there's too much of a culture of not standing up and accepting it when, when right's right. There does have to be a line of appeal for whenever decisions are wrong. There always has to be, a, but there has to be a, a culture somehow brought in. And it's difficult because it has to go right through the sport a, of referees' decisions, right or wrong, they have to stand and players have to be more respectful. Rugby's amazing how they do it. You sometimes look at rugby and initially... I would have thought the decisions must be very black and white because the players never argue, so it must be very easy. But listening to the World Cup and really hearing the in-depth analysis, you realise it was more of a grey area than even Gaelic seems to be, mm -hmm. and yet the players still manfully accepted it. And it's really impressive, and you'd love it to be in the sport, but it's it's an all-in approach because there's, if one team is very respectful and another team leans, leans on the referee a wee bit, especially in a sensible way, it it does work and and so it, it's a entire culture, and then there is the 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 disciplinary level which needs looked at as well in my opinion. Andy, you said that Dublin were worthy champions last year. I don't think anybody could disagree with that. Disappointing final, okay. But looking ahead in your crystal ball to two thousand and sixteen, how would you assess? Uh, how would you assess the season coming, and particularly the Ulster sides? I suppose the season coming, you're you're not going to get away from the from the same big teams. Uh, the gap is too big, and the development process is too big now uh, to suddenly get a panel out of nowhere. And because of the backdoor system, the big surprises, the big knockouts are really a thing of the past. So I think you're still looking at a very familiar look to the end stage of the championship next year, with particularly in the southern counties, Dublin, Kerry, Mayo, potentially Cork, depending on what Cork uh, turns up. But really, them's, them's really the only candidates. Ulster is a much more even playing field, uh, although we're probably still a wee bit behind the top three. Starting with Throne as a Throne man, I, I think Throne head into next year hugely optimistic. I think we always would have believed, and you're a Throne man yourself, so we always would believe that the talent is there within Throne, especially in them young players, uh, but they just never seem to have made that step up to senior football. Uh, they seem to have done that this year they've got the bit between the teeth they've got a taste of it this year and they're looking forward to next year interestingly I think being in Division 2 actually might actually help them they got a hugely strong defensive structure in place last year but they struggled with their attacking side of the game and their forwards struggled to get that cohesion and the confidence that just sort of nearly like bravado to play with a bit of guts up top uh, a couple of games they clicked but in the semi-final against Kerry it was our shooting boots let us down and our goal chances let us down Division 2 you would imagine they should rack up a bit more scores than they would have in Division 1 so that can get that attack inside of the game going whilst keeping the same uh, defensive system in place so certainly Mickey will be looking forward to next year and I think the Throne team has an ability now for the first time in several years I think to have an impact at the business end of the championship is there a two tier in Ulster? Like, you know, would you include the likes of Tyrone, uh, Monaghan, and Donegal in that top tier, and maybe the best of the rest, or is that is that being a bit uh, a bit harsh? I think Tyrone, Monaghan, Donegal are a wee bit ahead. I don't think there's that big of a gap to Derry, Down, Armagh, Cavan, and even Fermanagh. Brilliant to see Fermanagh back up in the mix. Mm. Antrim, I think, unfortunately, uh, remain some way off the the rest of that group. I think the great thing about Ulster is. Any of them also championship matches, and again, the also championship throw is a great throw. You're looking into them first, say, four rounds and plus the preliminary round, and really it's hard to pick a definite winner in any of them groups, So, and that's brilliant, and we'd all be looking forward to also championship. In terms of the likes of Donegal, again, you just start to wonder how often them players can go to that well. It is mm -hmm. such an intense game, and we know how hard Jimmy, McGinney, Jimmy McGuinness pushed them, uh, and now Roy Gallers in, and it's just can he get them to go again it seems to be that whenever Donegal hit that time in a game or certainly in their last match 
when when they hit that time in the game, whenever they had to write, dig in and sort of look deep inside themselves, they've been they've been through so much and they've they've given us all so much. They've been a fantastic side, but it is going to be more difficult. Maybe there's another kick at them, kick in them, but I struggle to see it. Monaghan, Monaghan have done fantastically well, but they need to really decide deep down for themselves: are they all Ireland contenders, or are they a good Ulster side? Uh, because their record in Croke Park in quarterfinals is now a monkey on their back, and it is going to be something that hangs over them. They are. It's 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 a big ask of Monaghan to make sure that they're in the quarterfinals, but I think they will be one way or the other. Uh, but they have to. They have to get over that step. They have to take a big scalp in Croke Park, and I believe fully that they have a good enough team to do it and a good enough manager to do it. It's just. Like that game against Tyrone, they I couldn't believe what I was watching the first five ten minutes. Tyrone were the team who should have been coming in, finding their feet, getting up to the pace and that there. And it was Tyrone playing all the football, playing with the confidence. Monaghan just you could immediately sense this nervousness among them, uh, and so it proved. And whilst they the, the game got distracted, then they end up about uh, Tiernan McCann's dive and the whole issue surrounding that there. And Monaghan were almost putting it down to that again that somehow Trone had cheated them a wee bit like the Sean Cavan attack a couple of years ago. In my book that was rubbish. Trone had Monaghan beaten that day and whilst it was only four or five points in it, Trone were definitely the better side and worthy of going through to the semi-final. So I would love to see Monaghan get to the semi-final uh, and I think they need to be pushing on further than that and I think they have the ability to take a big scalp but it's like Mayo winning the Ireland title. It's one thing saying they're good enough to do it it's up to them themselves to, to actually do it on the day and that's going to be a big ask. Sleeping Giants, Down, Derry, Armagh. What about them? And of course Derry have a new man and Damien Barton, our old sparring partner. Derry have a new man and Down have a new man too. Mm-hmm. So certainly them two teams, there's usually a bounce with, with, with a new manager. I, I think both counties don't have the same reservoir of talent than the, that they maybe had uh, six, seven years ago. I, but... The current game is a wee bit of a leveller. Uh, systems can allow teams with maybe not the same star power to compete at, at a very good level. Uh, I think for both teams, good league runs are, are critical going into the championship. And the championship draw gives gives both teams good chance, like Derry have thrown. And they'll, Derry will not shy away from that, never have. Uh, so both managers will be looking to find their feet very quickly uh, and 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 push their players very hard. It'll be very interesting and down. Last year there was a lot of talk about the players left off the panel. Then players are now a year older, some of the stalwarts, the likes of Benny Coulter, uh, were left off. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what, what take the manager uh, the, the, the manager takes on that, and the likes of Dan Gordon, players like that. But they're now a year older as well, so you'd think it's unlikely again that they're going to go back. You mentioned four uh, potential teams uh, down south. Is, is it those four, or can you name your six that are going to feature basically at the business end in 2016? Has Gaelic become that predictable now? I think it has, and I think that's what the back door has given us, and I think that's why there was a, a murmur, and, and maybe quite a bit more of a murmur, a good conversation this year regarding the change in the, the, change in the structure, the change of the back door system, and there's more and more... Uh, proposals being put forward. Now the GA appear adamant on, on sticking with the backdoor format because in these new proposals nowhere in it is there a rejig of the championship and this is going right on ahead to 2018 so it looks as if the backdoor system is there to stay. Uh, but I, think I can't it, see it ever being reversed. I, 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 Financial terms you know, it can never be reversed I think it will too. Uh, and, and there's I suppose the most obvious thing talked about is the need to separate it into a two-tier system and yet the biggest opposition to that is coming from the from the uh, in sort of inverted commas lower tier teams uh, that would be competing in the secondary competition they just have no interest they want to compete for Sam Maguire or not whether that's a realistic game for them or not uh, again we would like the international rules is it a choice for them teams to have that say mm-hmm. we would like the international rules the players are very much for it but there's plenty of discussion outside of that the smaller teams are very much in want to com- keep competing for the Sam Maguire, but I'm not sure you're getting enough big games against the big teams. We're only getting three or four big, big games each year. But can those low- lower teams, as you call them, you know, can they not compete for the Sam Maguire and then when they go out, uh, whether that, you know, in the back door, whenever they go out, then they can go and play for a, uh, a place in the so-called 
plate final. Squash does it. So many other sports do it. Why not? Yeah. Even the Champions League do it where the top mm-hmm. teams, some teams the drop League. into the Europa League. Uh, certainly that could be potential that division teams in the third and fourth divisions that after the initial run in the championship comes to an end, that if they go out, say, before the quarter-final stage or before maybe the fourth round of the qualifiers, that they would then go into a secondary competition. Uh, I, I think there is merit in that, but I think it has to be pushed a certain way with the GA it has to be there has to be big money up for the prize so that the team the winners get on a really good holiday there has to be really Let good push of advertisement Ireland. on it I, I, I would play them in all Ireland eh? there has to be a tie with TV rights that if mm-hmm. a company and rather than maybe going for the highest bidder in terms of TV or media rights have it that whatever the top whoever wins it has to give the same coverage to the secondary competition or at least a certain percentage of coverage to that secondary competition so that them games are covered so that they still get a bit of momentum behind them. The Tommy Murphy Cup in the past just was, so was just developed and it was a failure <laughs> from, from the moment it started. We could call it Sam McGuire Light, couldn't we? <laughs> it would need to be a good name. It need to be, be well name. named. Look, I appreciate uh, you coming in and talking to us, obviously, and uh, it looks like it's going to be the same protagonist next season and uh, the bookies, no doubt, We'll reflect that. I just want to finish off by letting you know that I know with McLean's that the uh, Toronto are sitting at uh, around about 20 to 1 to win the All Ireland. So there you are. That'll be very attractive. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Thank you.